District of Conservation is sponsored by the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. CFACT. To learn more about our sponsor, head over to cfact.org. Thank you so much for listening to the program. Welcome to District of Conservation. I'm your host, Gabriella Hoffman. This podcast offers a sober examination into all things hunting, fishing, shooting sports, energy, environment, and the public policy surrounding it. And this podcast also specializes in original interviews that you won't hear elsewhere. Here's what I have for you today. I'm really thrilled to have my friend Aaron Schmaus on the podcast. We've been playing back and forth over scheduling and and coordinating times, and now we finally found the perfect time to talk right after the new year. Aaron, my friend, how are you doing? How are things going for you? I'm great. Uh, A little bit tired. We just got in from Honduras. So um, actually last night we just got in. So a little bit tired, but part of that is getting up at 5 a.m. and trying to get my fat butt into the gym. So um, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. You have your hand in many different pools. So you run a podcast, which I would love you to share about. You are an investor and integral part of different companies and kind of like outdoor startups or upstart companies. So share with everyone your background because you have a really fascinating background. Yeah. um, I wear a lot of different hats. So I started out, um, I guess, way back. I grew up in Montana, went off, joined the military, got out of the military, um, and then went through a divorce. Uh, of course it was a military marriage. Uh, so cliche. And I, I really didn't have anything, um, when I, when I got out. And so I had a bit of a rough time and I, I ended up having some friends that got me a job and long story short, I quit that job. I, I don't really want to talk about the specifics of it, but it was for a good reason, um, for a good ethical reason, actually. And so I just quit on the spot and I had nothing to fall back on. So I started mowing lawns to pay my mortgage. And through mowing lawns, I ended up meeting different real estate investors, started working with different real estate investors. And I mean, my just my entrepreneurial brain just really, really started developing from there. And so I decided I wanted to come back to Montana. I had met my, my now wife. We've been married for what, 12 years now. And, uh, we have two daughters wanted to bring them back to Montana and kind of raise them similarly to how I was raised because it's such a beautiful area And I just, I've always been interested in the outdoors just because of living in Montana. And so there's, there's a lot that goes into what made me passionate about the outdoors, but, um, you know, because of my love of the outdoors, I invested in 6am outdoors, uh, which is a lightweight gear company, um, hunting, backpacking, camping gear. Um, so I, a really good friend needed a capital investment. So started investing in, in that, uh, always invested in real estate, you know, since, uh, around that time I was telling you, and um, actually, we're looking at buying property on an island. Yeah, believe it or not, I'm I'm not Thurston Howell. It is not that expensive. Um, it's like twenty five thousand dollars for a lot. So, yeah. So before somebody out there is like, oh, just a rich kid. No, that's that's not the case. It was just a really good deal that we came across. Um. So I I, I just. I do. I have my hands in all different kinds of things. I'm actually going to be revamping my podcast. Um, my podcast has primarily been based more outdoor type stuff, but uh, because I have such an eclectic resume, um, I decided that I'm going to just open it up to all things that just make you a primitive man. Uh, the podcast is called Primitive Republic, so just primitive at our core, you know, so, um, you know, just down to the basics, what you need to do to be the blue collar or white collar person, stay motivated, stay, 
uh, on track with everything and lead a healthy life. So you've had me on the program, if I recall correctly. I think we had a conversation on your show, and and you know how to really, you know, kind of ask for different questions. I think we delved into, I don't remember what topic, but something really deep. And I appreciated the question. So yes, Aaron has a great podcast and I look forward to hearing about the revamp when you have that finalized. I We we connected over POMA. I think it was the Franklin Conference or maybe one of the ones before that. I forget which one. I can't pinpoint exactly, but I've known you for a couple of years. And that's yeah. where I learned about your, your uh, podcast and your efforts. And we've talked a lot about policy and having a lot of overlap. And that's how we became friendly because... There's just a lot, you know, there's a lot of division in the outdoor industry. And then when you find like-mindedness in terms of like you support all forms of hunting or you understand, you know, multiple use or you understand this or you understand that. Um, Talk about briefly, Aaron, kind of what people misunderstand about Montana, because yes, everyone is flocking there. I think during the height of the COVID pandemic, you guys had an influx of people. I don't know if they could last more than one or two winters, um, but you guys had a lot of interest and, and surge of population, I think, unseen before. But a lot of people kind of have a disconnect about how you guys manage wildlife there. A lot of people are like, oh, I want to go see grizzly bears. How dare you hunt them? Or, oh, no, we can't manage wolves. Like, it's it's terrible. They're too closely related to the dog. So why do you think people have kind of this disconnect about management in Montana and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem in general? Um, and, And what do you hope that they could learn from someone who lives there about that kind of confluence of, you know, influx of people yet having to maintain, you know, wildlife to a reasonable extent. Wow. We could rattle on for that uh, on, Hey, you were just asking earlier, how do you, how do you talk for hours? But that could be one of those subjects right there that could really be easy to talk for hours. Um, so man, there is, there's so much that goes into that conversation. So ultimately I think, most people, they lose their ability to look at both sides of an argument. And I actually uh, commented um, with Lauren um, on Good Bull Outdoors. He had, he had done a comment talking about the wolves because he's having to deal with them right now in, Co- in Colorado. He's a great account. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I commented on him and I said, you know, they, and he was talking about, you know, watching wolves rip the fetus out of a cow and, you know, maybe people would, you know, maybe it would invoke a response from the anti hunting side or the anti management side of wolves. And, uh, I, I told him, I don't think that would even make a dent the closest. And, and this is true. A true story. Um, the closest I've ever come to making a dent, and and I think maybe I've swayed a few minds, is by telling them that I believe that wolves are beautiful, and same thing with grizzlies, but they have to be managed, um, and you know, do it a little bit delicately and stuff like that, and kind of tote that line. Uh, I hate. I hate to sound like uh, I'm maybe manipulative in a way, uh, (laughs) but it, it almost, you almost have to take a really subtle tact um, when dealing with that because emotions run really high around that subject. They do. uh, One way or the other. Um, You know, you'll have the anti-wolf side saying smoke a pack a day and then you've got the other side that says you need to move out of their territory and blah, 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 you know? So, um, it's, it's a really, really tough subject to breach. And I don't think that the media does a very good job at, and I don't mean all media, you know, like podcasts, like what you're doing right now, really educating people. Uh, I don't think they do a good job at, just educating on the subject and saying fair and balanced. Um, I think they push an agenda one way or the other, and uh, that's not helpful for anybody. So I think ultimately, um, you know, I I do live in an area where I've seen wolves from my house uh, chasing a herd of elk around. And, uh, 
you know, it's, you kind of learn to live with them, but at the same, at the same time, you learn to manage them. And the same thing with grizzlies. I think I, I showed you a encounter. Talk about that, that video. Yeah. Yeah. So I uh, was in a range where they had said that there weren't grizzlies, um, which that whole topic too kind of really upsets me a bit. Uh, but they said that, uh, there weren't grizzlies and here I am camping in the middle of the night on a hunt and I'm by myself doing all the things that you probably should not do. And, um, I didn't have food in my, in my shelter. Um, but I did find out that there was a kill site or, you know, somebody had killed an elk and, and gutted an elk, uh, within a quarter mile of, where I was camped and I didn't know. And so this bear, he comes and, um, you know, he's huffing and chomping and stuff like that right outside my shelter. And, uh, thankfully I didn't have to shoot. Uh, I had a lot of friends that were like, I don't know how you didn't. And I would have, um, at one point he ended up sticking his nose up underneath my shelter. And, um, yeah, I mean, that was a terrifying experience. Um, but yeah, I've, I've since had a lot of encounters with grizzlies and most of the time, well, well, for me, <laughs> every time, uh, they're not, they're not trying to mess with you. Um, you know, they, they want to go their other way. There, there are those times though, that they choose violence. And I've had four friends that have been attacked by grizzly bears and, um, one just passed within the last two years, um, from a grizzly attack. So, you know, it, they are dangerous animals and we have to be very mindful of them as they're expanding. The thing that, like I said, it really kind of upsets me is that, you know, everything that's going on with, with grizzlies in Montana is they're saying that the greater continental divide ecosystem, which is up by Glacier National Park, uh, it's actually a very big, um, very big area, just like the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is a, is a really big area. It's not just Yellowstone Park, like a lot of people think it is. Right. So uh, what they're saying is those bears are not traveling from one ecosystem to the other. So, uh, they cannot, uh, expand their genetic, um, their genetic traits. And, um, I, I think that that is completely false, um, because I've been in, uh, the mid sections in between there and I've spotted grizzlies in between there. Uh, where this happened was one of those mountain ranges in between the greater Yellowstone and the continental divide ecosystem. And so that just proves to me. And if you actually look at the map of where they've spotted these different grizzlies, uh, it looks like chicken pox all over wow. the map. So, uh, it's just, it's politic it's politicized, um, to a point where, it's the ballot box voting, like we talked about earlier, almost, you know, where one side is paying off politicians and, um, you know, it, it's not the best interest of the wildlife or the best interest of humanity. I, I completely get it, though. Um, you know, they want to put grizzlies back on the landscape. Cool. Uh, but you better damn well have a way to manage that situation because those are not a small, cute and cuddly animal sure, right. that we're, you know, we're just not going to have an issue with. So, uh, same thing with wolves. I mean, they're, they're not the Disneyfied Balto version, uh, of the animal. They're wild. They kill, they, uh, they thrill kill contrary to what, uh, one side wants you to believe. And, uh, it's detrimental. So. And these kind of complexities and realities, I would say are decently portrayed in, in a show that has 
largely come to be associated with Montana Yellowstone TV, um, which I hope they do return for the second half of season five and, and all the drama surrounding that. I, I was disappointed to see that, uh, but and glad that hopefully a conclusion will happen. But interestingly enough, you were actually able to be an extra in Yellowstone. That's correct, right? And and what was that experience like? Because when you told me, I was so excited, you know, being a, a fangirl of the program. Uh, but yeah. I want to hear your opinion about that. Like, did the show in your mind, like, portray Montana somewhat accurately? And then what was your experience interacting with the cast, if you got to? Well, it was a, you know, that's one of those shows. And I, I get a bunch of crap from my buddies uh, <laughs> for even being on that show. Because they're like, that show is the reason that Montana is blowing up right now. And in, in a lot of ways it is in a lot of ways I was the, I was one of the problem, but, um, it, it drives me crazy in a lot of ways that show does because it doesn't portray Montana in a really good light in, in a lot of sides of things. Uh, you know, you've got the Native American debate, you've got the wolf debate, you've got violence, you've got drugs, you've got, I mean, just all kinds of stuff in that show, which for sure can all be a problem in Montana. Um, but it's Hollywood and it's most of those issues are not as prevalent as the show would make it seem. Um, as far as the, as far as the, my experience on the show, I, it was great. I mean, it was, had really good dealings with the cast, really good dealings with the crew. I mean, got to meet Kevin Costner. I've met, um, Kelly Riley a couple times. Um, and she was such a contrary to her character. She is such a sweet lady. Um, you know, we're a bunch of extras sitting, you know, outside. It's really hot, you know, because we were filming in the summer and we're all dolled up and, you know, we've got suits on and blah, 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 blah. So it's, it's really hot. And she comes out and sits like she's known us forever and is like, does anybody need a water? Do you need anything? Are you hungry? You know, and I mean, she was just so sweet, such a sweet lady with her, with her English accent, <laughs> um, you know, and Luke Grimes got to meet him. He's, he's really nice guy. Less, I got to meet him, the guy that plays Jamie. Um, you know, I, I didn't get to meet Cole Hauser. That would have been pretty cool too. uh, kind of hit up all of them, you know, but, um, it was, it was a really, really cool experience. I had no idea just, just from the videography side, because I, I love videography. Um, it was just, I had no idea how in depth, all that stuff was or how many takes it takes just for one scene. I mean, it's just amazing. I don't know if you know this, but Cole Hauser, I was reading into him. He has two really fascinating like family characteristics or attributes um, in terms of his personal story. So on his mother's side, he's related to the Warner brothers. And oh, on wow. his father's side, he is, I think um, his great grandfather or great great grandfather was governor of Montana, so he has some weird, interesting Montana connection. I, I actually did read about the um, the connection to a former governor. Yeah, yeah, uh, but I, I didn't know about the Warner Brothers. I'm sure that probably helped his um, at least get a foot in the door into the movie industry. <laughs> It, it probably did help a little bit, but it seemed like he didn't want to, you know, fully exploit that. Maybe he wanted to break out on his own, but he seems like a cool guy. But I, I don't know. It's kind of, uh, you know, division in, in the Yellowstone world from what I read from. I wouldn't say tabloids, but from news reports, he's like battling out with Taylor Sheridan over coffee, copyrights. So mm. I, it's not. Uh, it seems like all of them it's, are. Yeah, uh, acrimonious, <laughs> unfortunately. But yeah. I do love the program. And there are some aspects truthful kernels of of things in the show obviously hollywood like you said dramatized but at least you had a good experience you know to be there and, and to meet the cast like that's why the show 
at its height, it was the most popular show in TV. And when it returns for the second half of the final season, I have no doubt they'll break ratings. Um, but I haven't seen some of the newer spinoffs from Taylor Sheridan, but they look really good. The Bass Reeves one. Um, I watched uh, 19, what is it? 20? 1911. Or no, 19, no, no, no. The, the one, the de- Depression era one with uh, Meryl, Her- Helen Mirren. What am I talking about? Helen Mirren, Harrison Ford, uh, 1924. Great spinoff. And then there I watched... 1880 what was it 1883 1883 that was a good one too yeah i haven't i haven't watched any of them so um (laughs) yeah i i I keep telling myself i'm going to but uh i i'm still a full-time student and this is my last semester so uh this focus on school first (laughs) yeah i'm taking six classes this semester so if i didn't have enough going on uh I've got that too. So you can watch it later down the road. Uh, no worries. No yeah. worries. So Aaron, what are some of your, let's say conservation or outdoor new year's resolutions for 2024? What would you like to see? Would it be any meaningful policy reforms, people understanding wolf and bear management, um, maybe understanding conservation outside of the United States better? Like what are a few things that you would hope um, you'd like to see from the industry or from people outside the industry who at least start to grasp conservation Anything you'd hope for this year? Um, you know, I guess in a way I'm kind of a pessimist because I don't know, like I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to the media changing. Um, I would like to see more information come out about, you know, what it's actually like with wolves. I I think I saw, I can't remember who it was that posted this, but there was an article that came out that, um, Oh, it was uh, Lone Star. Yeah. He posted, he posted the article that he and I spoke about on his show. Yes. Cable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Where, where they were talking about um, that. Hunting in peril. Biodiversity. Exactly. You know, and nothing could be further from the truth, but I'm I'm a student of statistics and you can make statistics look as bad or as good as you want. And, you know, I, I have a feeling because I haven't read the entire article, but just based off of the headline that uh, a lot of the biologists probably paid uh, that are, having to do with that article um, probably took small snippets of the statistics or mm-hmm. didn't give the 10,000 foot view of what was going on um, is poaching a problem. 100% It's a problem. I do not agree with it. Is that so detrimental that it's going to uh, impact wildlife management across the entire United States and really hurt wildlife species. I don't think it's that big of a problem. Uh, Not at all saying that I agree with it in any form or fashion, uh, because I, I really do believe in the North American model, but I don't think it has as much of an impact as maybe that article might have portrayed. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't agree with the premise that poach, like we do have a lot of jerks who poach and Cable and I had talked about uh, the case involving Virginia's like famous deer, deer, how some idiot poached it from 70 miles away after seeing it on social media. Like that's a problem. That's not every case. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's indicative of of the wider conservation movement. We call out right. these jerks all the time. Like it's it's a problem, but is it truly imperiling conservation? No. In a way, I would say that it it probably does, you know, um, in a way, right? Uh, we've had this talk, and I've I've really wanted to get people who have I tried to get the Bomars on, um, they shut me down, but uh, I I would like to get people who have formally been criminalized, and rightly or wrongly. Uh, for poaching and would like to just sit down with them and talk to them about why they did it. Because my, my perspective is that those famous people mm-hmm. uh, that 
did that kind of stuff, it's it's for likes. And oh, definitely. the psychology behind it is probably, you know, they they love that dopamine hit when you've got, you know, 500 people liking and congratulating you on such a beautiful animal and blah, 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 blah. Not to mention the endorsements that come with stuff like that. Um, and the outdoor industry is a very, very tough industry as an influencer to be in and actually make a living in. Um, so because it's such a fun industry, anybody's willing to provide you pictures, videos, all that kind of stuff for swag or for, you know, maybe a piece of gear or something like that, you know, or coming from somebody who owns a gear company and yeah, for comp, uh, for compensation on those kinds of things. So it makes it really, really hard in the outdoor industry if you are a paid influencer. Right. And so they do it for that livelihood. And I think they get caught up in it. And the people that they um, that they persuade by doing all of these things, I don't think is a good thing. And who knows how many influencers are actually doing that? And and that's that goes across the board for all different types of industries. I mean, you look mm-hmm. at the fitness industry. You it, what was a Liver King? come to find out he's all on TRT and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Right. You know, you, all you got to do is eat raw liver and you can be as jacked as me. No, Uh you're a clown. You know, um, it's, it's not as cut and dried as that. And a lot of times if it's too good to be true, it usually is. Yeah, it usually is. So uh, one of the things I would like to see is people get called out more for that kind of stuff. And, you know, Lone Star, you know, he, he does a really good job, I think, at calling out a lot of the issues and stuff. Um, make hunting great again. I love those guys are hilarious. They, they do a good job at calling those people out. Um, you know, I would like to see more of that. Um, I don't know with the social media side of things, um, being so strict if you'd be able to get by with doing that or it would be considered bullying, you know, um, because I've, I've been suspended and stuff like that on some of my accounts for calling people out and that's you know, crazy. It get, it get uh pop for harassment or bullying. So, you know, I, I don't know how, I, I don't know where that line is, but I would love to see more of those people come to light more sunlight. And, okay. And get shown uh, to be the frauds that they are. I think that is happening. Um, definitely with the case of the Virginia deer, that guy was shamed a lot. And then there was an incident with an outdoor life freelance writer who claimed to have killed. Did you see that story out of Utah? He claimed to have harvested a, a girl's mule deer. No, I didn't see that one. Oh, oh. He got rightfully, I wouldn't say canceled, but called out. And then he actually lost his writing gig with Outdoor Life because like, he engaged in unethical sportsman behavior, uh, claiming that he he shot the deer more than it already had to be shot and took it from a girl who took the shot. And it was a collared deer. So I think that was the contention over you know him claiming it's his when it was actually hers. Um, and there was debate over like whose story is truthful, et cetera, et cetera. And then it was found obviously that the girl was correct. Like her husband or boyfriend, like was there, there were other eyewitnesses and yeah, the guy who was, you know, pretending to be this knowledgeable writer was, you know, found out to not be so, uh, honest and, you know, ethical with that. Yeah. So it is happening slowly, but surely across everything, because there, there are a lot of, uh, opportunities to engage in grifting um just because there are a few guardrails in place to prevent that it doesn't matter if you're like you said what industry it is it happens so I, I like your plans of um expecting better from media people and, and myself and a few others are trying to pressure them to do that you want more education you want repeat sunlight yeah. to be spotlighted on well real quick i mean mm-hmm. it that is a very bittersweet thing because look at the case where the guy was shoving weights down the fish's mouth oh my gosh those two um, morons yes yeah so that doesn't show sportsman in a good light at all no. when it does come to light he also you know, poached some deer too not just fish oh i didn't know about that he had a history I, I knew too. about yeah. the huge 
fish scandal or whatever, but you know, that kind of thing, it, it does not bode well for hunters because they see us all in the, the same light, you know, oh. and, um, the mainstream media gets a hold of that and they're like, look at these big name hunters and, you know, look at these big name fishermen. They're doing all this stuff that's unethical, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and it doesn't, everybody kind of paints us with a broad brush and they, the media doesn't show that we don't want that crap either, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know where the fine line is, but I think sunlight is the best disinfectant. It's just, you have to be able to see everything, not just what's in the sun, but what's in the shadows too. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know where, where that line is. Yeah. I think there's an appropriate line you can draw in terms of like not being a jerk, but then also being, you know, accountable or holding people accountable for their actions. Because if you're saying you're this big representative of the industry and your views or your actions represent everyone writ large, that has a lot of implications if you're found out to not be honest or if you're engaging in criminal or questionable behavior in general. And so yeah. I think there, there's a way, and I think we are as a whole, everyone is like being more careful, you know, to point out any discrepancies in certain accounts or posts and it needs to happen. You have to, we have to kind of self police ourselves. I think that's a reasonable yeah. ask. Well, we're, we're, um, you know, we're starting to lose the, uh, the hard work aspect of things. And we all now want that short-term gratification. So when you see the people that are on the videos and all that kind of stuff, that's, that's why, um, you know, Steve Ranella, uh, Newberg and, you know, some of these other guys, when they don't get something, let me tell you from somebody who does do videography for different, uh, shows and all that kind of stuff. It is extremely hard to do a good video where mm -hmm. you don't get anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just because, yeah, you put it out there, but at the same time you want people to watch. And if you have any sort of network behind you, they want viewers because it's business. That's how that works. And it's hard to keep eyes when they're not successful. That's why, you know, yeah. like I said, the liver king was blew up so big because it was like, Oh, I could do this without, you know, using all this testosterone and stuff. And all of a sudden I can be big. No, it doesn't work that way. There's work that goes in behind it. And you're not uh, always successful either on hunts. Yeah. I've had my fair, I think my fair share of misses and seeing nothing. So it's perfectly natural. Aaron, we are starting to run out of time, but tell everyone where they can connect with you. Yeah. So you can connect with me at primitive Republic podcast on Instagram. Um, you can hit me up on my personal on, um, on Facebook. That's Aaron, A-A-R-O-N S-C-H-M-A-U-S or the primitive Republic. Uh, I'm on TikTok also it's primitive underscore rep. Um, you can email me, uh, archery, Aaron at archery outdoorsman.com. Uh, you can also find me with, uh, V I A M outdoors, um, yeah, or underscore outdoors and Instagram, Facebook, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm involved in all that. So. All right, Aaron, thank you so much. And we hope yeah. you come back again. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. If you enjoyed what you heard today, go leave us some reviews on Apple and Spotify or wherever podcasts are played. Your feedback will help us reach more people. And I love to know what is on your mind after each episode. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to never miss a beat or a guest announcement because that is our way of updating all of you listeners. And we have just hit a thousand followers on Instagram for the podcast account. Thank you very much. And if you have any guest suggestions or topics you want to hear on the show, I'm all ears. I would love to hear your feedback there. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next episode.